Good evening and welcome to CDNY Country Dance Lore. We have a wonderfully, we have one topic tonight, but a wonderfully varied program uh, because tonight's lineup involves several community members reading from Cecil Sharp's writings. Uh, this is a program led by Paul Ross and it is Cecil Sharp in his own words. So I'm just gonna briefly go through our back of house stuff, which you know, but ritual is good. Uh, in a few moments, we'll begin the presentation. Um, it runs about a half hour. Paul has, has been careful to, to keep it in the time, which is, is really a uh, careful craft. Um, we'll do a Q and A uh, at about 10 after or so, and we'll move on to socializing. Uh, we are recording, uh, as you probably heard when you came in, this is being recorded, this program, and we're also live streaming to Facebook. Um, when the recording is finished, it will be posted. It's on Facebook immediately, it's on YouTube. You can grab that link from the CDNY homepage. If you don't wanna be on video, you can turn off with the stop video here, and that helps with your internet stuttering too, if you're having trouble there. We ask you to remain muted during the presentation. We have several speakers. They will unmute themselves at the time of their reading but otherwise please stay muted. Uh, if you have questions or remarks, please throw them into the chat box. It's lovely to, to read what you're thinking and, and, and saying as we go along. CDNY is continuing to host some virtual events while we figure out how to get back into in-person events and more on that in a moment. Meantime, coming up on Saturday, we have our annual members meeting. And not only do you want to be there, of course, but we need you there because we need your vote. We need a quorum in order to vote in some new board members to keep the wheels running and set up uh, plans, including fall plans. Um, there is discussion about what we can do. Um, come and hear that from directly from Shoshana. Um, and if you cannot be there, you can vote by proxy. And I was gonna grab the link to throw it into the chat box, but I didn't remember to do that, but we'll get that in there soon. It's, there is a proxy page, uh, which you can email to our current secretary. So that's Saturday. Next week, a week from tonight, we have CDNY Live hosted by Cynthia Shaw, and the musical guest band is Hold the Mustard. In this series, I am speaking the next time, and I had posted it as a either uh, a dance topic or a community event. And I discovered as I was researching for a dance topic that no, I really only have room in my brain and interest in getting back to dancing in person and talking about it. So we have more questions than we have answers, but to the extent that we have answers and we wanna share our questions, I want to do that with you two weeks from tonight. Um, some, you will probably have some more questions as well as answers after Saturday's members meeting. So I would like you to bring those. And if all goes well, we will have a survey. If I am lucky, it will go out before this date so that I have some direct feedback from you to begin with. But if not, it will go out afterwards and we'll get your feedback. And in person, uh, we can talk about what we know, what we don't know, what we wish for, what we're worried about, and so on as a community. Um, if you wish, please send me feedback at englishprogram at cdny.org. And if you wish, you can make a donation to CDNY. Uh, speaking of donations and CDNY and so on, another reminder is it's membership season. Remember renewing your membership? We didn't bother doing it last year because we weren't having in-person events. Um, in anticipation of resuming something, we hope in person in the fall, we are attempting to bring back the traditional membership cycle running from September through August. So if you are so inclined, please renew your membership. And we're going to have links to the membership uh, available online on the cdny.org website. I am Dorothy Cummings talking at you week after week. Thank you for putting up with that. I would like to thank my volunteers for tonight. Jeff Berry is running Zoom controls and live streaming to Facebook. And thank you, Jeff. And Margaret Berry is running the door, letting you in 
and quieting you if you forget and don't mute yourself. All right, on to tonight's program. Tonight's speaker is Paul Ross, and he has he is pursuing a question or pursuing an important figure in the history of English country dance. And he has an interesting, I think, origin story of, of why his interest in Cecil Sharp particularly. Um, Paul is a careful dance instructor and uh, a wonderful dancer. Uh, and I'm looking forward to dancing with him and the rest of you in person. Whew, okay, calm down. Meantime, <laughs> I'd just like to welcome Paul. And Paul, I now hand it over to you. Thank you, Dorothy. <clears throat> and good evening, everyone. Uh, a dozen years ago, I called a Tuesday evening English dance at CDNY called a Cecil Sharp birthday celebration. Sharp was born in 1859. So our dance that November uh, mark the 150th anniversary of his birth. We not only dance the reconstructions of his whose titles you see listed here, we also read aloud pertinent passages from his six country dance books, which illuminated something about the dances we were about to do. So tonight we reprise the reading portion of that evening also in anticipation of the dances we are about to do or, or hope to do sometime in the fall. This was a community effort in 2009 and I'm happy that it will uh, be again tonight. So thank you to all the readers in advance. By the way, in just three years, we'll be marking the 100th anniversary of Sharp's death. So you can follow my lead and you should have plenty of time to get your selfie with Sharp already. The topics we'll touch on in our brief time together tonight are the shape of the room and the disposition of the dancers. I don't mean the emotional disposition, I just, <laughs> I just mean their physical uh, layout. How the country dancer moves, defining the figures of English country dance, the language sharp used for dance reconstruction, and the music of English country dance. During the readings, which will come from Sharp's six volumes uh, called the Country Dance Books, we'll hear a very pre-modern use of proteins. This was how Sharp wrote and most likely spoke, and we'll be faithful to that usage since this is Sharp, Cecil Sharp in his own words. And now we can move on to the next section. Sharp had well-defined views on most topics related to English country dancing. So it comes as no surprise that even the shape of the room and the spacing of couples is specified. In book three, he provides this diagram. And uh, Susan Amacy, if you'd like to unmute, uh, Susan will now read to us the related text. The following diagram is a ground plan of the room in which the dances are supposed to take place. The upper and lower sides of the diagram will represent respectively the right and left walls of the room. It's left and right sides, the top and bottom. In Playford's time, the top of the room was often called the presence, alluding to the dais upon which the spectators were seated. The expression facing the presence means therefore facing up, i.e. towards the top of the room, while back to the presence means facing down toward the bottom of the room. Thank you, Susan. So Sharp goes on to clarify even further the shape and geometry of the long way set. He writes, the dances in this volume, and this is from volume one, are all of the long ways for as many as will formation and can be performed by any equal numbers of men and women, not fewer than eight in all or 10 in a triple minor set dance. The performers take partners and stand in two parallel lines, the men on one side facing the women on the other, each dancer standing opposite his or her partner. 
the distance between the lines should be approximately five feet and between the couples about two and a half feet. I'm glad he said approximately and about or we'd all need to get out our tape measures during the, before the dance could begin. <laughs> when we think of the way dancers moved in Sharp's time, we think of this well-known photo from book six. And uh, Dorothy, if you can show that, yeah, thank you. I, I think this was taken in 1916 in Amherst at the Agricultural College where Sharp taught a summer course in, East, in English country dance. Um, but I, I wasn't able to determine if that's exactly the uh, provenance of the photo. Anyway, the dancers uh, here performing Parsons Farewell lean into their track with only their momentum keeping them from falling over. And now Lynn Feynman will read Sharp's description of what is happening in terms of how the dancers move. The transition from step to step, that is the transference of weight from one foot to the other, must always be effected by spring. The motive force, although derived in part from this foot spring, is chiefly due to the action of gravity brought into play by the inclination of the body from the vertical. The dancer in motion is always in unstable equilibrium, regulating both the speed and the direction of his movement by varying the poise and the balance of his body. When moving along the straight, for instance, his body will be poised either in front of his feet or behind them, according as his movement is forward or backward, and laterally when moving along a curved track. Thank you, Lynn. I remember that some of us used to dance like that. <laughs> anyway, despite the fact that there were videos of sharp dancing, such as those shared by Danny Walkowitz in his CD lore presentation, instructional videos on YouTube were not a thing in Sharp's time. He had to use the written word to describe how one moved in the country dance. And his language is both richly descriptive and colorful. In book one, he minutely describes the steps in English country dance, including the walking step, the running step, the skip, the hop step, the slipping step, the sideways step, the skip change, or as Sharp puts it, the change hop step, and the change hop, which is the same as the change hop step, obviously without the hop. Here's his description of stepping in general and the slipping step in particular, as read to us by Danny Walkowitz. The following general directions apply to the execution of all the steps used in the country dance. One, country dance steps always fall on the main divisions of the bar i.e. on each of the two beats in duple measure and of the three beats in triple measure. In the case of a compound step, that is one that comprises more than one movement, the accented movement should fall on the beat. Two, the step should fall on the ball of the foot, not on the toe, with the heel off but close to the ground. Three, the feet should be held straight and parallel, neither turned out nor in at the ankle. Four, the legs should never be straddled but held close together, nor again should they be extended more than is absolutely necessary. The spring should as far as possible take the place of the stride. Five, the jar caused by the impact of the feet on the floor should be absorbed mainly by the ankle joint and very little or not at all by the knees. The knees indeed should be bent as little as possible. Six, all unnecessary movements should be suppressed, e.g. kicking up the heels, fussing with the feet, raising the knees, etc. Ah, last, the slipping step is a series of springs made sideways off alternate feet, the major spring being on the outside foot, i.e. the left one going to the left, 
and the right when going to the right. Well, the leg, although the legs are thus alternately opening and closing scissor fashion, the motion is affected almost wholly by the spring, not by the straddle. The legs therefore should be separated as little as possible. The free foot should not be allowed to scrape the ground. Thank you, Danny. We, we'll see the slipping step in the shuttle figure in part two of picking up sticks. Hopefully we will not hear any scraping. <laughs> so Sharp meticulously describes the common figures of English country dancing. For instance, he uses the following words to describe the back to back and deploys a diagram to make it perfectly clear. Tom will read the relevant passage from book two. Thank you, Tom. First man and first woman face each other and move forward. The man along line AB, the woman along the dotted line DE. They pass by the right, move round each other back to back and fall back to places. The man along the line BC, the woman along the dotted line EF, four bars. <clears throat> the arrowheads in the diagram show the positions of the dancers at the end of each bar and the point in the directions in which they are facing. The arrows outside the lines show the direction in which the dancers move. Thank you, Tom. So this is rather straightforward stuff, as are most of the definitions and occasional diagrams for poussette, gypsy, arm turns, hand turns, doubles, setting, set in honor, and so on. The hay is not so straightforward, but surprisingly the sheepskin hay in picking up sticks is clear as day, or maybe clear as day in, in the English channel, I'm not sure which. The hay, or, sorry, um, if you read it with care, and contrary to what you might think, Sharp was not all that certain that what we sometimes call swirl siding was the correct interpretation of that move. In the video of the dance picking up sticks, uh, which we'll see shortly, the dancers use swirl or sharp siding. But what did Sharp think of this figure? Orly, could you read for us, please? Uh, uh, what Sharp says about siding in book two. And we want to go back to that um, uh, picture, yeah. The side is performed by two dancers, usually partners, but not necessarily so. They face each other and move forward a double obliquely to the right, i.e. passing by the left. On the third step, they make a half turn counterclockwise completing the turn on the fourth step as they face one another, two bars. This completes the first half of the movement and is called side to the right. In the second half of the movement, side to the left, the dancers retrace their steps along the same tracks. The dancers must remember to face each other at the beginning and close at each movement. Thank you, Orly. So Sharp was not fully convinced of the correctness of this interpretation, observing that, quote, I am aware that although the margin of doubt has been materially reduced, I have not succeeded in eliminating it. The later students of the dance, beginning with uh, Pat Shaw, would subsequently introduce what we know as side-by-side -side siding as an alternative to Sharp's figure. But let's give Sharp credit where credit is due. He himself briefly considers side-by-side -side siding in book six. In these words, which Margaret Barry will now read for us. Further evidence, which has come to light, seems to throw doubt upon the accuracy of the half turn in each portion of the side in the form in which I reconstructed it. Now, if instead of turning, the dancers were to fall back to places along their own tracks, the side 
would then be identical with the Morris figure of half hands or half jib. And this, I suspect, may prove to be the correct interpretation. But until it is supported by far more definite and conclusive evidence, it would, I think, be unwise to make any alteration in the figure as it is now executed. Thank you, Margaret. And of course, we know he didn't. He didn't change that in his instructions. But whatever assessment we make of Sharp's decision in this case and his work in general, we must, I think, acknowledge the care that he put into his research and his willingness to consider the evidence for his interpretations pro and con. Now, um, before we, we talk about the language of reconstruction, uh, we're going to look at a video of Picking Up Sticks, which was danced in New York in 2009. You can pay attention to the liveliness of the stepping, remember that? <laughs> and to the siding at the start of part two, and also to the track of the sheepskin hay in part three. This is the full uh, dance from beginning to end. Well, the original text from Playford for that final figure, the sheepskin hay, reads as follows. The women standing still, men going the hay between them, the last man going about the middle woman, do thus three times over, then go quite round all the women to your places. And then he repeats that <clears throat> um, for the women. And now I'm going to ask uh, Daniel, Daniel Popowitz, would you please read for us how Sharp instruction, instructs us to do this figure, uh, which we call the sheepskin hay, 
uh, but which he described without the aid of a video or a diagram or without even calling it by that name. <coughs> first man, first man followed by second and third man crosses over in threads or haze through the three women inside second and outside third. The first and second man on reaching the third woman pass clockwise completely around her and face up, while the third man, instead of following second man round third woman, passes counterclockwise completely around second woman and faces up, thus becoming the head of the file. Skipping step. Third man followed by first and second man, then haze up to the top. The second man, now the hindermost, instead of following first man round first woman, passes counterclockwise round second woman and facing up. The three, now led by the second man, then hay once again to the bottom, the first man, now the hindermost, passing counterclockwise completely around the second woman and facing up. Led by the first man, the three, now in their proper order, hay up to the top, turn to their right, cast down to the bottom, and then move up to their respective places. Did you all get that? <laughs> there will be a test. Yeah, so that's the full elaboration uh, in Sharp's words of what he found in Playford. But nowadays we might demo the sheepskin hay or we'd say the top dancer lead your line weaving in and out um, around the standing women or men with the last in line reversing direction to take the lead. Or we might just call men or women sheepskin hay and expect them to know it. But they would know it because more than a century ago, Sharp described it with such precision. Speaking of precision, there is such a thing as too much of it. And some of Sharp's reconstructions suffer from that vice. Take for instance, the description of the B portion, part one of Grimstock, uh, which Lee Goldberg will, will now read for us. Bar one, first couple and second couple change places. First couple going down between the second, skipping. Bar two, first couple and third couple change places. Third couple coming up between the first. Bars three and four, second couple and third couple change places. Second couple going down between the third. Bar five, first couple and second couple change places. First couple coming up between the second. Bar six, First couple and third couple change places, third couple going down between the first. Bars seven and eight, second couple and third couple change places, second couple coming up between the third. Thank you, Lee. <clears throat> so all these words in this disjointed phrasing, just to describe what we call a mirror hay. But from the tangle of moves, it's hard to discern them. And I have to confess that as a young man, when I read this, I actually thought the moves were distinct, sort of go, then stop changes. I had no idea it was a flowing figure. But to his credit, Sharp does caution his readers that what he breaks up into parts to explain should be danced without the seams showing, as it were. And in book six, he writes the following, which Beverly, uh, would you kindly read for us? Continuity. The directions given in the notation are divided into parts, figures, etc., only for the sake of clearness of description. The aim of the dancer should be to conceal, not to call attention to these divisions. In learning a dance, it will probably be necessary to dissect its movements, to parse, so to speak, each component section. But in the finished dance, these subordinate elements must be pieced together and merged into one continuous movement, as complete and organic in structure as the movements of a symphony. To this end, the dancer must think ahead, perceive the relation between that which he is at the moment doing with that which is to follow, so that he may give to the concluding cadence of each subsidiary phrase its just degree of emphasis and pass on without hesitation to the movement that follows. Every dancer's dream. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that this is still the goal of those of us who aim to dance well. 
Well, dancing well is one thing. Dancing well and having a great time doing it is another. So just to show off a little of that, let's take a look at a classic sharp reconstruction as danced at the Lennox Assembly, where the dancing is pretty good and the fun is bursting out all over. This is Dargison, um, a dance with an, a unique formation among those that Sharp published. <clears throat> and with a simple but surprisingly exciting set of figures. Um, <clears throat> there's some mistakes made at the beginning which shows that the dancing at Lennox was not perfect. <laughs> But take a look at uh, Nikki Herbst and Deb Carl. They are having a blast. <clears throat> and now we can look at this, uh, this uh, video of Dargison. Oh, that was fun. I, I should mention that Daniel Popowitz taught this uh, in New York in 2019, in April of 2019, and uh, it is definitely worth bringing back. Um, does anybody know how many times the band has to play that tune? 19 times they have to play that same tune. And this band, I think, added excitement uh, to it by modulating upwards as the dance progressed. And that brings us to the music of English country dance. <clears throat> Many as of us have voiced or heard voiced various criticisms or complaints about Sharp's musical choices. He put a dance with the title that evokes elegance, Step Stately, with a tune whose name Jack Pudding decidedly does not. He added a second B music to Mr. Beveridge's Maggot, even though the instructions in Playford specifically say the first strain is to be played twice and the second but once. He used the Hare's Maggot 
for Up With Eiley, original set, originally set to another tune in 9-8 time, and so on. But don't imagine for a moment that Sharp's choices were casual or ill-informed. So I'm going to ask uh, one of our musicians, Lisa Terry, if you could read for us, please, what Sharp says about the music from the introduction to book six. It is impossible to examine the dances of later editions without being impressed by the beauty of a large number of the tunes they contain. I suspect the majority were contemporary airs pressed into the service of the dance by the Playford editors. The Siege of Limerick is the tune of one of Purcell's songs. And I cannot resist the suspicion that the same master hand was responsible also for several of the other triple time airs, especially the hornpipe airs, such as Dick's Maggot, Mr. Isaac's Maggot, Maggot the Hare's Maggot, etc. Whatever their origin, the beauty of these airs is incontestable. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Lisa. So as these words suggest, Sharp held the music in high esteem and he did his homework into sources. Sharp came from a musical family and had taught violin in Australia while working for the Chief Justice of South Australia. Eventually he became assistant organist at St. Peter's Cathedral in Adelaide, a member of the Adelaide String Quartet and of the Cathedral Choral Society. He founded the Adelaide Philharmonic Choir and in 1889 founded the Adelaide College of Music. He definitely had a musical background for his work reconstructing the English country dance. As an example of how carefully Sharp considered the music and its evolution, listen to what he writes about the music for Jenny pluck pairs. Upon comparing the same tunes in successive editions of the Dancing Master, it will be found that many were subject to frequent alteration. I suspect that many of the quote unquote gross errors of the first edition were no more than modal peculiarities, which by the suppression or addition of sundry accidentals were subsequently quote unquote corrected in the second and later editions. Jenny Pluck Pears, for instance, appears as a Dorian air in the first edition. In the second edition, the Dorian was converted into the minor key. Finally, in the fourth and subsequent editions, the tune became a major one. Now let's listen to this ravishing tune for Jenny Pluck Pears. The dance is a round for six in three parts with a chorus following each of the standard USA figures. Listen for the change of meter in this wonderful recording by the Bears. We'll hear music just for part one. <laughs> So that brings this portrait of Cecil Sharp in his own words to a close with a sample of the gift that he gave us beyond words. 
the music of the English country dance. Thank you very much. Oh, applause, applause, applause. That is so well done. And I've loved having so many community members reading passages. Well done. Thank you so readers. much. Yes, yes. Oh, so I, I was busy burning up the chat box. Um, I, I want, ah, yes, uh, time for a little Q&A here. Margaret Berry, would you care to read the couple of questions that came up in the chat? Well, the primary question was how many hits Picking Up Sticks got on, on Paul, the uh, Child Grove uh, YouTube channel. And Jeff checked, and the answer is 70 thousand and Dorothy thinks that's a lot of sticks <laughs> I want to know who puts all those sticks down before they get picked up yeah who does the picking up <laughs> yeah well I'll tell you there's another sharp reconstruction on the child grove channel that has even more hits and that's the Newcastle yeah how many oh I don't know it's over 70,000, wow. Yeah, it's okay. like, yeah, over 70,000. <laughs> you know, yep. that's, that's like a bestseller. That's really <laughs> impressive. <laughs> in, the, in the English country dance world, it's really making it big time. Yeah. A, a few more million and you can monetize that channel. You know, I actually could monetize it according to the number of hits on that channel, which are now over half a million. Wow. 550 some odd thousand hits. You callers out there, stop looking at this stuff so many times. <laughs> we can't help it, Paul. Yeah, yeah there's probably a, a few of us responsible for a lot of those hits. By the it's way, been a, it's been now, a long now, pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> Now that I hit that number, that they've the Google has placed ads in front of each of my videos. Oh. <laughs> but um, I, I can't monetize it until I get a thousand subscribers, and I'm up to seven seventy five. Hey. <laughs> Dragoon your friends. Yeah. So um, before we just so, sort of make this more private and and stop live streaming, were there any questions, Jeff, on the Facebook? Uh, chat box. Jeff says no. Jeff says no. Okay. Have, most of us are a, here. Uh, In fact, most of us are here. Yeah, I have a question, or it's probably just a comment for Paul. Sure. Uh, I, I didn't look at Susan's uh, reading prior to when she was reading it, but is this odd that uh, he would talk about the layout of the room? And he would say the upper and lower sides are the right and the left, and the left and right sides are upper and uh, top and bottom. It's just, it's just such a very strange way to lay out the room and, sideways and say the upper and lower are the left and right, but the left and right are the upper and lower. So just my comment. I, I agree with you. I, I noticed that same oddity, and I was thinking, huh, that's kind of a mind uh, bender when you're trying yeah. to orient it yourself. less space on the printed page to diagram it that way. <clears throat> yeah. It, it really had to paper. do with, exactly, <laughs> you yeah. um, know. His editor I, was ruling with an iron fist, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, um, so book one was published in 1909 and book six in 1922, and Sharp died in 1924. So there was a, a great span of years, you know, between the first and the last. Um, and they went through some revisions. I think all of them were eventually um, edited by Maud Carpoles because they, the book one was released in 1934 and then the others were released in 1927. So um, who knows, maybe in one of those editions, they got the room oriented correctly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah. it corresponds at least to some of the orientation for the diagrams of the figures. True. So they would match up. You could overlay those figure diagrams onto the room. Yeah. I'm not sure I follow Beverly. Well, Playford, of course, oriented his figures across the page, even though the head of the, of the set was at one side. And, so and the, 
And the back-to-back -back figure that I read was up and down on the page, which would have been overlaid onto that room that he described, rather than showing it um, side to side. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say, Dorothy. Yeah, that, that's what I understood. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Now I'm more confused, but I appreciate the effort. Yeah, that back-to-back -back figure, I was quite, I mean, I was muted. But I was just laughing the whole time. I mean, with the point A and point B and, you know, it's like you're trying to take a flat piece of paper and make a box out of it. Fold flap A and tab B and... Some of those diagrams are quite similar to Thomas Wilson's uh, diagrams from the early 19th century. So I wonder if Sharp had seen those and was using that format. Tell me about the Thomas Wilson diagram. Oh, he had um, solid lines and dotted lines and A's and B's to describe where you moved doing figures. Um, and it was, it's very similar to um, Tom's figure. What sort of dances was he, was that? These were country dances. His uh, big publications were shortly before and shortly after 1810. So they were still doing country dances. Boring country dances, but country dances nonetheless. <laughs> the Chinese menu country dances yeah, yeah. of pick something from column A, column B, column C, and smash it together into a figure. Yeah, one of his books does that, allows you to, you know, create your own dance. I think the progression must have always been in the same set of figures um, so that you would have one progression in your set of figures that you chose for your dance. Well, I mean, when I'm teaching brand new people, that's what I do. I guess if you're going to keep it simple, I suppose at that time, do, do we know? And I'm, I'm, we may not know. Were people still doing steps footwork at that point? We think they were doing footwork, but it's not described um, very much at all. But there is some difference between dancing and walking. Um, one example of that is in Mansfield Park when a Fanny Price attends her first ball. Towards the end of the evening, she is observed walking down the set rather than dancing. And then they send her off to bed because she's too tired. <laughs> now you all know why I invited Beverly to be one of the readers. <laughs> well, all of us are smarter than any of us, that's for sure. <laughs> Lisa, oh, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm just going to add one last thing, and that is, I, I think I said this um, before folks entered the meeting, but I'll say it again for those who weren't there. Um, I started dancing 50 years ago at the University of Chicago, 1971. And not too long after that, uh, anxious that my, our teacher might leave and nobody would know how to call the dances. I started writing them down. And then I, I bought the Sharp books. And when I read the Sharp books, I was so impressed by how he laid out everything so logically. So um, I know that most of us get our instructions from more current and contemporary uh, publications, but I still think it's very valuable to go back and read those books. It is funny how he didn't use some modern terminology. I can't remember the, the description, but it was basically two or three sentences to say what a half figure eight is. And because he didn't have the term half figure eight, he repeats those two or three sentences over and over in every dance that, that has that figure. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lynn Feynman said granular. Yeah, <laughs> right. very. I guess that's what you have to do when you don't have shorthand. Actually, I was going to ask Lisa Terry as uh, you, well, I don't get to hear from you very often. I don't get to hear from anyone very often if being a pandemic, okay, coming back. Um, the, the passage that you read had some observations on the, the changes in the published form of the music. But I was wondering if you had reflections on that, on that passage or on um, what you've seen in early Playford music as printed and corrected. Just, just wondering what your experience with that is or opinions. 
I think that was a, a passage Paul read about that um, uh, Jenny Pluck Pears was in Dorian mode originally, and then it was later in minor and then in major. And so what that means is in the original and in the version that Paul played, uh, it's modal. So there are no raised, what we call leading tones. The seventh of the scale can be sharped and that makes it, um, that makes it later. It's not modal anymore. It, it's uh, stacked up in uh, the type of music that we play now where we like to have a, a chord that's a major chord that delivers the next downbeat, you know? So you would raise certain tones. And so in the version Paul played, those tones were lacking. You had a, a lowered seventh. In the version in Barnes, it's a sharp seventh. And then he said something like a later version, even everything was major. So instead of being minor, like a da 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 da, it would it would have had the the major key. So it just they they thought that modal music sounded wrong at a certain point. They didn't understand it, and so they started adding sharps and things to it to make it sound more tonal. And then they even <coughs> didn't like the minor keys, so they made it all major. <laughs> was that typical of all kinds of music that in that progression of time from 1650s onward, if, if you happen to know that? that yeah, I, I mean, even, even by 1650, if something was completely modal, it sounded old fashioned and odd. And so by 1705 or something, it would have sounded really wrong. So they would have had to add some different uh, chord tones to make it sound right to their perception of chord progressions. And then all of us who like love early music, when we we're reading from the Barnes books, the, the uh, chord choices to go with the tunes are often so wrong if you're like steeped in early music. And so Cynthia and I are always are changing things to nice. be the right chords. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and Chris too, yay. <laughs> yeah, that chill. sounds like a thing. That sounds like that would be a thing that um, these later editors changed the wrong things based on the taste of their times. That's right. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of chords in the older music that where the bass note needs to be not the root position. Well, anyway, it, it needs to be a different chord altogether to make it the progression right for what a Baroque composer would have done. Neat, thank you. Thank you for, you know, leaping onto that at my <laughs> sudden wish. This, this tells me something about all of that. Uh, I, I think I used to think, uh, you know, it was only really in modern times that we would mess with earlier music to bring it up to the way we liked it. And that was going on centuries ago. People were saying, oh no, no one likes those modes anymore. This is what the music of today, 1651 sounds like. <laughs> Let's do it that way for to, to please modern ears. Wow. Yeah, changing it to the right way. Paul, we had a question from Myra and Paul about what year was the sheet music from for the modal piece? It was interesting that it didn't have bar lines. It was taken from the first edition of the English Dancing Master, which would have been, I guess, 1650, 51. Yeah, and bar lines weren't that common back then. Yeah, they just wrote the tunes out straight and I spoke with uh, Gene about this subject uh, today, and he said there's some thought now in the historical performance um, community that musicians back then would have just made these corrections on the fly rather than writing them out. And Lisa you is mean, sh shaking her head up and down. <laughs> you mean, That's so true. Yep. <laughs> you, mean, you mean musicians 40 years later made the changes on the fly? I don't, I don't. I'm not sure I follow. Even, um, <coughs> I, think that, I think that even in the, like I was saying, even in 1651, having the lack of tonal progressions uh, in the music would have sounded weird to them because that was already the Baroque period. So instead of being the Renaissance period, I mean, so they would have just raised tones to make it sound more attractive. 
and that didn't need to be written in. Because they were professionals, they knew you should do that. Yeah. Got it. Also from the chat, Lynn Feynman says, if Sharp's audience had no information at all about the dancing, the minute instructions would have been necessary. We, having learned by doing, may be driven nuts by those same details. <laughs> so more a comment than a question, but very apt. We're sometimes driven nuts by the modern rendition of those of those figures <laughs> well it, am i am i right paul that sharp was writing for people who were sort of coming from nothing like they didn't know anything and so um this uh it was starting from scratch right with his so, answers yeah so in context i think you're right i think you're absolutely right yeah well, I'm glad also, that, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Just to say, I'm glad that he also addresses the energy of the dancing, which is the part that I was reading about, because just just moving and taking little steps in a particular direction is not very interesting. How true. Yeah. Well, we'll all have to relearn how to do that. <laughs> oh, please. I'll be lucky if I can. <laughs> too many of these steps. My sister Margaret Cummings says she loves the description of the dance is becoming seamless and that continues to be the goal. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's it's the 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 dream, you know, that we're all reaching for. Well, I, I'll just say that Margaret's seams never show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean dance. All right, wise, I gotta unmute for that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd provoke something. <laughs> well, we get those very exhortations all the time from all you all you dance leaders, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Margaret, Dorothy, Beverly, everybody. Uh, they, you know, you talk to us about how how to fill a phrase so that the next thing we're not stopping and starting. It's 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 wonderful. And of course, the thinking ahead part, which is, you know, yeah, that's tricky, yeah. hard to do. You know, well, I know um, a lot of people have commented on being worried about, oh my God, will I remember how to do this? And I would just like to offer, um, if anyone would like, when we get back to dancing, I would be happy to stand by their side and recite the sheepskin <laughs> hay instructions. <laughs> I can just follow you around and, 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 and say them in your ear, and I'm sure it'll really help. You can be the referee. <laughs> yeah. I'll come to yeah. New York for that, Daniel, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Please. oh yeah. You know, just, just ask. I'd be happy to do it. <laughs> and if you would like maybe a uh, Russian accent, you know, or, you know. Just read I, it a I, little I take faster. requests. I take requests. Read it mm. a little faster, if you would. A little faster? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I would very much like to see that. <laughs> Oh, we're, Jeff, going Jeff we're gonna, you didn't just say that, Jeff. You we're going to do this. That. We will do this. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> you should know better than to say that to me. Uh, I, no, I do know better. I know exactly <laughs> what I was doing. All right, all right. This is devolving into social, which is fine. But, <laughs> but perhaps it is time to thank Paul Ross once again. Thank you. This is, this is wonderful. Thank so you very on, much. So specific, <laughs> great readers. Thank you all. Um, I suggest that we conclude this, the live stream to Facebook and uh, continue just, just as you were. <laughs>